Thank you everybody for coming along this evening to our fantastic uh, Judy Vira tasting with Giuseppe. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name's Mark. Uh, I'm the head buyer for United Sellers. And it's my great pleasure to, uh, to bring you these fantastic wines through, through United Sellers. And um, I'd also like to introduce uh, my co-host here is, is uh, Luke. Uh, Luke and Jane. So Luke will be running the uh, the chat room, and Jane will be running our Facebook Live stream hi. as we as we do it. So say hi, guys. Hello. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Thanks, guys. Now joining us from the UK, uh, as he does most weeks, is is Alistair Cooper, Master of Wine. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Hope you're all good morning. Well. Good evening. <laughs> yeah. Excited about this one. Excellent. And then, of course, joining us from, from Italy is Giuseppe Vaira. How are you, Giuseppe? Very well. Buongiorno a tutti. And it's, it's a great joy to be together. <laughs> um, so thank, thank you, Giuseppe. And uh, yeah, b buona, buongiorno, buonasera, buon pomeriggio, wherever you're coming from. And um, thank you for joining us. Now, today we're going to be tasting through three wines of Giuseppe's, uh, from Giuseppe's estate, it's the Giudi Vaira wines. And, uh, but first of all, I'm just going to hand over to Luke for a second, who's just going to mention um, your, the, uh, the prize we can win this evening. So over to you, Luke. Yeah, brilliant. So welcome, everybody. Good to see some familiar faces as well as uh, a couple of newbies. So welcome. Hope you have a really nice evening this evening. A uh, couple of bits just to mention. Firstly, we'd love it to be as interactive and engaging as possible. Um, so there's a couple of ways that you can uh, ask questions if you'd so like. Firstly, feel free to unmute uh, and jump in anytime you want um, and put a question to any of our experts. If you don't feel too comfortable doing that, we've got a chat box uh, that you can just write your comments or your questions in and I can uh, interrupt and, and get them answered. Um, we also are live streaming on Facebook. So if you've got any friends or family that you think would enjoy the tasting, get something out of it, please do invite them along. Um, Jane will take care of all the uh, comments from the Facebook users. Um, so as you can see on the screen, a uh, bit of excitement here. Uh, we've got a competition to win $50 credit on your next order. So what you need to do is just text your favorite wine of the evening using the four letter code uh, that you'll see on the screen there with your name and email. And uh, we'll spin the famous wheel of wine at the end of the night and it's your chance to win the $50. So good luck with that, and um, hope you have a really good evening. Thank you, mate. Fantastic. Okay, so let's... Uh, first of all, I just wanted to give us a bit of orientation before I hand over to, to Giuseppe to talk about uh, where, where we are in the world. Now, Giuseppe's been absolutely fantastic and very helpful here in pointing us, uh, giving us a lot of direction as to where his vineyards are and where, where the vineyards are that we, we source from. So the vast majority of tonight, we're actually going to be not necessarily looking at, at images so much as looking, trying to take you kind of into uh, using Google Maps, take you into the vineyards themselves rather than showing you pictures of bottles, uh, which we, we have been, we've been hinting at in the past, but we, we really want to go a little bit deeper in, in that this week. So uh, thank you, Giuseppe, for, for being so fantastic with showing us exactly where we're, where we're going to be visiting today. So first of all, I just wanted to give you a bit of orientation for those of you who, uh, to, who haven't seen these maps or haven't, haven't been through any of these with us before. So where we're heading is obviously there's a map of, of Italy showing all of the wine regions of, of Italy, which of course are, are many and varied throughout Italy. Italy is grown in basically every state of the country uh, and some of, some of which, some areas of which it, it's grown with unbelievable volumes. We're heading here to the northwest of Italy, up here in, in, in Piedmont, uh, the capital of which is, is Turin, in Torino. So I'm just going to go to our, our next map here. So we're, we're kind of zooming into this area here. Now, the region of Piedmont is, is actually one of the, the smallest producers of wine in all of Italy. So it, it's actually not about volume here in this area as it would be in, in other uh, areas like Chianti or, or Valpolicella, for example. As you'll see here, it's kind of centered around one area within Piemont. To the north of this area, you've got the, the, um, the mountains. It's very, very mountainous as you go north towards, uh, towards Switzerland and towards 
and then to the, the west towards France. As you can see, the little word you see across to France. So it is a very, very mountainous region we're heading to here. But I thought I'd just give you, um, uh, hand us over to Giuseppe for a little while, just to get his opinion on, on what, because it is a really, really unique place. And I might go between Giuseppe and, and Ali here, and just to get your guys' thought on what makes the, the region of Piedmont so unique. Well, th thank you, Mark, again, and thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to get to be together. Well, I usually say, Mark, that Piemonte is a battlefield. And if you look at the beautiful map you just, uh, you just uh, pointed out on video, you can see all of the, I think you call it orographics, uh, all of the mountains surrounding the region. So if you look south, uh, we have these uh, mountains, which uh, we call, um, is, is very much the, the junction between the Alps and the Appen Apennini, which is the, the mountain ridge that runs north to south. So starting from the south, we have those uh, sort of shorter mountains. And then to the west, we have some of the taller uh, peaks of the region. One is portrayed in the, in the picture you, you had at the beginning of the presentation. And then as we head north towards Valle d'Aosta and, and to Suisse, there is farther and, and even taller mountains. And I call it the battlefield because uh, we are really compressed between the Mediterranean influence coming from the from the Mediterranean Sea on the south, and then continental weather blowing from the north. And unfortunately, these two tend to, tend to clash exactly on top of our heads there in Piemonte. So historically, this has been a region with, uh, with a challenging weather, um, steep hills pretty much everywhere you go. Um, we, we were uh, isolated by these mountains for, for centuries, which explains why we have such unique varieties that we grow. And, uh, and I think these are just three of the most basic elements that, that may make Piemonte be, be a special land. Just to give you an idea, none of our designated uh, wines as a region ever the past you know, 10 tons, and we're talking the more entry level, but as you go into Barbera or Dolcetto or Nebbiolo and eventually Barolo, we tend to have a maximum yielding of eight tons which really not many wineries achieve, especially if you're, if you're talking quality. When you, I, I really appreciated that comment from Mark about you know, how we are sort of a lower yielding region in, in the landscape of Italy, because if you go to the plains, you could easily get 20, 30 tons per hectare. So we're talking really a fraction of the production, most of that being, being a, a consequence of the, of the hillsides, of the prunings, uh, pruning system we have. But then if you look into history of Piemonte, there was also scarcity of great vintages up until the 80s. You know, pretty much uh, you can count them on, on two hands, uh, the great vintages between the, the 80s and, and the 70s and the 80s or even the 90s. Uh, so climate change has had a strange influence on us because we're actually experiencing uh, a wealth of fantastic vintages in recent days. Not to say we're, I mean, we are concerned about the climate change, but we, we come from a, from a background of being such a challenging uh, place that is actually being, uh, being fairly good on us. And uh, yeah, I'd say this, this is it. And another aspect is our proximity with France. Um, the Piedmontese dialect, which is what my grandparents' generation would speak primarily, uh, sounds much closer to French than to Italian. Our royal family was the House of Savoie, um, coming from across the mountains from the Savoie region of France. Um, so I love that there's also a bit of an influence there when it comes to a sense of place, but also our cuisine has somewhat uh, achieved or gained the best of the, the Italian culture for, for raw ingredients and then a touch of that French sophistication for, for sauces and creams. And when it comes to the wines, uh, it's all about fragmentation. So it's a very different scenario visiting Tuscany, for example, uh, or visiting Piemonte. Uh, Tuscany can be somewhat more associated with the Bordeaux landscape. You have the chateau, you have the house or the, the winery, and then all of the vineyards surround it. When you come to Piemonte, uh, there is a sort of higher density of vineyards, 
because the region is the, the vineyard region is so much smaller. But then within every designation, blocks are extremely fragmented, just like what you would see in uh, or experience in Burgundy. And I think that is that is a consequence of um, a, a very deep respect for the differences of every crew, so that people have split vineyards over generations because uh, because everyone wanted to have a piece of these and a piece of that. I hope it makes sense, Mark, as a, as a start. There'd be more, but I think uh, there's already a lot on the plate. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, one, thank you very much, Giuseppe. And, and I would encourage everyone, um, if you haven't already, I can, I can definitely see some, some glasses being poured, but I would definitely encourage you to uh, have at least the first glass poured, if, if you can, the, the Barbera to start. Um, and, and to, to be thinking about these wines by drinking them uh, as, as, as Giuseppe is talking about these, uh, about these areas, most definitely. Um, so we're just going to, I'm just going to go to, uh, oh, sorry, that just skipped one there. Um, as you just mentioned there, I mean, that, that couldn't have been a better introduction uh, had, I, had I sent you this script to, to read yourself there, Giuseppe. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, just a little, little bit of a history here that I've written about um, the, the foot of the mountain, which is what Piemonte means. So it, it, the kingdom of Savoy, as you just mentioned, and that's fantastic to know that, that your family has that connection there. So um, the, the house of Savoy was, was a very, very influential um, group at the, at the time. And there, there's a lot of history and culture and they were known. It's so interesting. You, you call it the battleground because the, the, the people who fought in the house of Savoy, the, the warriors were so, well regarded as uh, as mercenaries and were hired all around the world so that the battleground still uh, it, it still is reflected there so that's very interesting so the french influence as you mentioned is is really really clear and and having 75 percent of your wines in in piemonte being DOC or DOCG level which are the top two levels of quality in the region is, is very impressive and as i said here a focus on single varietal wines so that's where we that's where we start. We've got we've got two varieties that we're talking about tonight uh, across three different bottles of wine. The first one we're talking about, of course, is we're going to come back to this image here as well. I just thought I'd, I'd get us onto the Barbera to to start us off with. Now um, I'm going to throw over to to Ali just for a couple of seconds, just to talk about your impressions of of Piemonte. Ali, you and I have have travelled Piemonte together. Um, and, and I know that you have a, a strong passion for it. We have some fond or potentially not so fond memories of, of running the hillsides with you. You're an avid jogger and I am definitely oh, not. So Goodness me, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty hard to add really much to what Giuseppe said as an introduction. I mean, it is, for me, the greatest, we, we touched on this in a few other tastings we've done. For me, it's... Um, it's all about quality over quantity. I mean, people would say that the two greatest grapes in, in, in Italy would be Sangiovese and Nebbiolo. Um, but when you look at the statistics of how much Nebbiolo is grown versus Sangiovese, um, I can't remember the hectare that's planted, but it's, 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 a, it's a fraction. It's probably a tenth, uh, probably maybe, even, maybe even less than that. Um, but we mustn't forget that, that actually Piemonte isn't just about Nebbiolo. And we're about to try the Barbera here um, and what I, I love is difficult, you know, looking at what Giuseppe said about the climate, it is just this incredible meeting point of the, the Mediterranean, where meeting the, meeting the Alps and the Apennines, and um, it, it gives this whole maelstrom of different um, soil types to play with, from, from limestone to more sandstone within Barolo. So you just get huge variations within small terroirs, which we know as you would consider with Burgundy, um, is what makes it so fascinating. But as I say, we mustn't forget Barbera, Dolcetto. And then, of course, um, there's a whole host of other indigenous varieties. We've got Arnais as well, and Gavi, um, you know, so Cortese. So these are things that are important to consider. Um, and again, I know, Giuseppe, for anyone that was here last, or two weeks ago, was it, when we had Steve Purnell with us, um, there we, we had the story of the Riesling, which maybe Giuseppe can tell us about in a minute. So there's also a pockets of, you know, amazing international varieties that have made their way in here, which have, have caused a little bit of controversy, I would say, probably in the past. But we've seen that great Chardonnay can be made here. We've seen that great Riesling can be made here. We've seen that pockets of Cabernet can do well here. So it's just a, a beautiful area. But for me, the key is it's all 
on quality over volume, which doesn't happen much in Italy. If you look at Sicily, if you look at, as we say, we look with Suave, you look at Prosecco, all of these areas. Um, here, it's all about quality. Um, and the, they're very clever the way they use the different aspects. Aspects are so important in this region for planting, you know, northern facing versus southern facing and, and the different grapes that have adapted to that Barbera, Dolcetto and Nebbiolo. So for me, it's just, um, it's just this, everything comes together perfectly. But of course, as Giuseppe said as well, climate change is an issue as it is all over the world. Um, but I'm sure that they're, they're already looking at ways to mitigate that by planting on different, different aspects, which is fortunate that they have that. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to trying this Barbera, which I think is one of the great underrated and great value grapes in, 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 in the world, actually. Fantastic. Absolutely, mate, I completely agree. And, and let's, let's get into this Barbera now. Um, Barbera, I, Barbera, I think has been treated a bit badly in, in the past. And it's got a bit of a bad rap as being kind of the poor cousin of Nebbiolo. Mm. And I mean, the, the truth is that Nebbiolo is kind of the king of the region and Barbera's kind of a little bit left in the shadow. But there are some Barberas that I've tried, especially in the last few years, that have really, really changed my opinion about this grape variety. And there's actually some, some producers in the New World uh, in Australia that have been doing some fantastic things with Barbera. And I think it's got a really, really, uh, a really bright future. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this one here, Giuseppe, if that's okay. Of course. Yeah, well, uh, first, first of all, a word on, on the grape. I think you already touched on many of the aspects. If I, if I can add a, a touch of color there, uh, just to enhance the perspective that Mark was giving about, and Elia we were giving about Barbera, back in the 70s, this was pretty much the lorry driver grape. And what I mean by that is that, of course, we're talking a world where, you know, we had less concerns about drinking and driving. And those lorry drivers wouldn't mind holding a bottle of their Barbera just off the windshield, chilling. Uh, these wines were maybe not even 10% alcohol, brisk acidities. Uh, and it was really a bit of a, a workhorse for Piemonte. And then it was around in the mid 80s that a new generation of producers started to, to, to give preeminence, to give dignity to Barbera. And I think, uh, as Mark rightly pointed, this is still sort of escalating in terms of better and better Barberas. When it comes to, uh, and, and one more aspect about the grape is that to start, it's perhaps the most versatile of our varieties when it comes to planting. It is a very bushy uh, variety. It is very lazy. It's like it's sitting on a chair. When you look at the canopy of, of Barbera, it's like, you know, barely sitting, laying back on a chair. So it's, one, it's the one grape that around June, July, gives us the most headaches because you have to be back to the vineyard every week doing canopy management. Otherwise, these, these shoots will just fall on the sides of the rows. But then so you've got to go in great... there, you've got to give it a kick and make sure it wakes up, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but then it, it is sort of very versatile with the soils. And it is, it is also good soil uh, transparent variety. So it's very interesting. We're going to talk more of this Barbera you have in the glass, but this is a blend of six blocks on the three main soil types of the region. And it's really impressive because every, every block has its own personality. Uh, but then another aspect of Barbera is that it has a, a bright acidity. Now we're far from, you know, the 10 grams of uh, acidity of the Barberas from the 70s uh, that would really attack your teeth. Uh, but it makes it for for a fantastically versatile grape with with food with cuisine, and uh, and this is sort of a portrait of Barbera in general. When it comes to the one you have in your glass, as I mentioned, it's a uh, this is our introductory Barbera, but is uh, no short of complexity in the sense it's six vineyards that we we've blended over time with a view to create uh, a wine that is both fun and easy drinking, but if you, if you stick your nose or if you're in a moment of, uh, of peace and you, and you wanna focus on the wine, there's plenty of uh, layers. Uh, we love to go for long vinifications. So these are about 20 to 25 days of skin contact, which means that when you pop the cork and it was really, and I haven't told this to, to Mark and Luke yet, but thank you so much for suggesting popping the corks and letting the wines breathe. Because uh, some Barberas can be just, you know, popped and, and drunk. 
But when we go for a long maceration, it means the wine sort of folds uh, just, just a book with many pages. And so some air on this Barbera really helps letting it blossom and, and open up. Um, aging is, uh, is a traditional aging. And in our view, whilst Barbera is the grape that can handle the most oak, uh, we, do not like, we, do, we do not like to over oak our wines at all. So in this case, there's a majority of stainless steel uh, aging. And then about 10% of the wine was aged in natural oak casks and barrels with a view to allow the wine to mature and breathe, but also retain as much freshness as possible. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you, Ali, for um, answering that, uh, that question we had online for the, um, the soil types, uh, limestone and sandstone. That's, um, that's good to know. And yeah, that's, that really truly is a very, very enjoyable example of Barbera, in my opinion, that really does. I think it brings together the prettiness of Barbera. It can be a really, really pretty grape. It's got some gorgeous red fruit characters, but there's still, there's still a, a brightness of acidity. It's not too tannic or hard or bitter. That's a, that's a really, really pretty enjoyable wine and a, an absolutely perfect place to start us off this evening, I think. Yeah, it's gorgeous, isn't it? I've, I've got to say, I love that, 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 that florality behind there, just gentle florality. But for me, as a lot of us probably agree, acidity is so important in wines. Um, and as I said, as Mark Savage, who, master of wine, who, who first was one of my mentors, I remember very clearly, he said, the first duty of wine should be it, that it should be refreshing. Um, and that's always stuck with me. And I think it's a really important mantra, actually. And, and that's what I love about Barbera, that, that, that refreshingness, that ability to even drink it on its own, but it goes incredibly well with the diversity of foods as well. And that subtle florality, I've got to say that not every Barbera is as good as this. Um, this, is a, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very, very classy example. And actually I remember years ago, Giuseppe, having your, your Barbera at a tasting in London at Liberty Tasting, yeah, probably 10, 12 years ago. And it was the first time I really went, wow, this is this is this is what it's all about. So it's a it's a it's a cracking wine, and as I say, one of my favourites, the most underrated grape varieties, I think. Yeah. Grazie, Ali. If I if I may, just uh, a couple of uh, f f funny funny things about Barbera. The two birds that you see on that label are meant to sort of represent um, not really the birds, but the the keys in between. Um, there is such a diversity of Barberos produced today. You can really range from the super fresh and young, but sometimes where the acidity almost tastes a bit too prominent. Uh, albeit I love that quote of, uh, of Marek Savage. It's, I think it's really brilliant. And then you have the opposite spectrum of super concentrated Barberas. And we would really like to find that kiss in between, that sense of balance where you have the, the complexity, the texture, but you still have that sort of uh, sense of refreshness and, uh, and drinkability. And um, yeah, this is really a bit of the, of the purpose of, of this wine. And then the second aspect is about, uh, this is a very sort of intimate family story, but uh, I love how my mom, when we were growing up, would always say Barbera was the one grape that would be closest to her personality. So be mindful about this, uh, this thing on Barbera. It is a grape that does evolve. It might not have the aging potential of Nebbiolo, um, but you will definitely see a, a, a maturity coming in place. And just like, I guess, my mom was, she was called La Sindacalista. La Sindacalista would be the union leader, uh, the one, you know, fighting for the right. And that, I think, was pretty much my mom growing up was sort of a feisty, um, uh, strong personality and uh, now you meet her and she's the the most uh, charming sweet person and so goes the Barbera evolution it starts uh, brisk and edgy and then with some time in of aging and then in the bottle uh, it does acquire that sense of roundness so I think that might also be a suggestion for people if you like your wines to be sort of in the in the in the rounder side uh, do not be afraid to age your Barberas a year or two more or if you like more of that freshness and, uh, and kick of drinking, then uh, go for your younger vintages. Fantastic. Giuseppe, I'm, I'm definitely going to remember this wine through your analogy of the birds rather than the, the lorry drivers. I think it's much more <laughs> birds than, than lorry drivers, for me anyway. <laughs> okay, so we, uh, we're going to move on to the next wine now. Um, our first Barolo of the evening, the Albe Barolo.
And I'm actually going to switch over to Luke's screen now because, as I said, as I mentioned, I hinted at two at the start. Giuseppe's been really, really helpful in pointing out exactly where the vineyards are. So we're going to give you a, a, a tour through the vineyards from a socially distant um, aspect here. And so first of all, we've got an image of, of Piemonte, the, the larger image of the state of, of, of Piedmont. And in the center there, you'll see this, this, uh, the, uh, the flag of, of Piemont, which I believe was the old Savoyard uh, flag as well. Indeed. Yes. And, uh, and so now we're gonna go, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into, first of all, we're just gonna see where the Giudivara, where the, the estate is, where the winemaking facility is. Oh, sorry, first of all, we're going to actual, the, the town of Barolo. There you uh, go, which you is can see. Center. And, and this 3D map that we're, we're using here, it gives a great, it's most useful, I find, when you're, when you're in a really hilly area like we are here in, in Barolo. And it's very, very hard to get, to see how mountainous it really is without taking this 3D image and, and, and going in and seeing the undulations of the, of the mountains here. So it's, it's a really, really great way to, to, to see it. So, here we go, We're moving around the, the town of Roller. And now if we can just go on to the-, uh, the Mark, would, would you mind, can I just interrupt you for a second before sure. we change uh, a view? But just two things. The first is, is kudos to, to the team, to your team, because this idea of using Google Earth is just brilliant and, uh, and, a, and a premiere for me and it's so fantastic. But looking at this image, it made me think, we explained what Piemont, Piemont or Piedmont mean. But uh, maybe this image can also help us understand what Lange means. Uh, Lange is, as you know, the sort of smaller region that surrounds and includes Barolo. And when you look at the shape of our hills, as you can see, they're mostly stretched hills. So that's the meaning of Lange, which literally is uh, tongs, tongs of land. And this, uh, this shape was created mostly by uh, the, the pressure and the compression of the Alps, sort of raising and, and shifting soils. We can talk about this later if someone is interested. But then the erosion that came during the Ice Age or at the tail at, uh, at the Ice Age sort of carved through the soils and created these tongues of land. So where you see sort of those um, narrow and stretched woods at the bottom of the hills, they sort of define the various hills and you can, you can see they're really sort of tongues of land. This is, this is the meaning of Lange. Sorry for interrupting. No, mate, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. fantastic. I didn't, I did, did not, I honestly did not realize that that was where the word came from. So that's fantastic to know, yeah. Okay, perfect. So now we're gonna to move to, we're gonna, this is an image of the, the cellars of Giudivara. As you can see, very, very close to the center of town of, of Barola proper. And this is, and it's kind of in the thick of things, really. So, and then Giuseppe's shown us that the, where this wine comes from, the Albe, the 24, the Barolo Albe, it actually comes from three separate, vin, uh, three separate vineyards. And Giuseppe's pointed out quite specifically where each one of these is. And you can see that in this map just here. So Giuseppe, would you mind running us through each of these vineyards and just kind of, do, do you choose these to go into this wine specifically for, for a reason? Well, yes. Uh, Albe is, I often refer to it as, as a tribute to the masters of tradition. A name that everyone who is in love with Barolo know is Bartolo Mascarello. The winery is now run by Maria Teresa, the daughter of Bartolo. And, and they're just amazing, amazing people and producers. But then I'm going to mention a name which is a bit more of a, of a secret in the trade and is Franco Fiorina. Uh, this winery no longer exists, but when you when you pop uh, a bottle of the 1980s from Franco Ferina, these are some of the bottles that gave me the, the broadest emotions. What, what these two wineries and many more have in common was the so-called super traditional approach to Barolo, which would uh, be about blending vineyards together. Now, it is, it is true that Barolo had a, had a faith and had a I believe in uh, single vineyards forever. The oldest bottle that is stored in the castle of Barolo is actually a bottle from the late 1700s. And there's no Barolo mention on the label, but there is Canubi, 
So single vineyards were already named and defined and wines were produced from single vineyards even before Barolo was officially recognized as a wine. However, it, it's not until the 1960s, 70s that people started to reconsider single vineyards. And when you look at uh, the masters of the past, they always blended vineyards to achieve uh, superior harmony. So the idea of Alba is really to focus on that blend of vineyards and revive that uh, idea of, of blending vineyards as a sense of harmony we want to achieve in the wine. Uh, we chose these three vineyards because they have differences, but they also have things in common. To start, they all belong to the Tortonian soil, which is, is a marl that is very typical of our hill. It's a white bluish marl with a very small presence of iron, a lot of calcium, and so it produces sort of more lifted red to purple flower um, aromatics in the wine, sort of tense and, uh, and uh, refined. And uh, we chose three blocks with three different exposures. So Fossati, which is the one bottle that shows um, on the upper part of the screen to your right, uh, it's a vineyard facing southeast around 400 meters above sea level. The road that you see just behind the bottle is a road that drives from Barolo to La Mora. So you're driving north in that direction. And the vineyard is a sort of vast amphitheater on the southeast orientation. Then we have La Volta, which is the bottle that appears the most south in, uh, in Google Earth. It's currently out of the screen, but yes, there, there you are. That vineyard is a fully south-oriented block. La Volta is, uh, is a more recent vineyard um, that we plant. I, it was actually one of the first vineyards I helped planting in my teenage. I, apparently, I was playing too much soccer during summer holidays, and, and that's how I started to work at the age of 15 in the vineyards and in the cellar. And then we have Costa di Verni, which is the smallest of the three blocks, but it is one of the most historical vineyards. Uh, similarly to Brico delle Viole, these are vineyards that are well recorded into, into the history of the region from the 1800s. And there it is, that's a southwest uh, facing block. So that's the name Albe means sunrises in Italian. As we can see the sun rising three times every morning, as long as we're early enough and fast enough, we're gonna go on Fossati first. Uh, on a summer day, late summer day, we would see the sun rising around 620, uh, 630. Then we jump on the off-road, drive to La Volta. 10 minutes later, you can see the sun breaking the line of the horizon and for the third time here in Costa di Vernier, which, uh, as I mentioned, is, is a sort of west-oriented uh, facing vineyard. So that's the concept of Albe, to be traditional, um, in a way to achieve harmony and drinkability, despite um, not using oak, because it was, it was also a sort of politically incorrect Barolo when we first released. You have to imagine in the early 2000s, there was a big conversation that whoever is sort of uh, passionate about Barolo must have crossed or heard about at least once or twice in his life. There was a big battle between sort of the traditionalists and the modernists. Uh, these were two groups of producers making both amazing, amazing wines, but with very different uh, techniques. And the modernists who are sort of the generation who is now in, in their maybe 60s and, and, and 70s, those were the people who first traveled to France and came back inspired with different techniques and vinification approaches. Um, and they were producing barolos that were fantastic, but they were approachable because of a lot of use of oak. And to us, Albe was actually um, a, a bit of a response, not that we wanted to be uh, polemical or political on that, but, but we just thought we could achieve harmony and drinkability by taking the best of the tradition back again. Uh, so it is a long vinification. Long vinification means you have to be very gentle with punch, punch down and pump overs. But to us, that's the way to steal the real personality of Nebbiolo from the fruit into the wine. The wine is aged in large Slavonian casks. So you will, you will feel a very minor influence of, uh, of, of these. And of course, being large casks, they sort of allow less oxygen to, to evolve the wine. So you, we, we tend to retain a sense of freshness in the wine. And this is Albe. The colorful label, on the other hand, was, uh, was a message as well. It's from the artist who painted the stained glass windows at the winery. 
um, when you walk into the winery is a, is a contemporary facility. I didn't speak uh, uh, about us, but we are a sort of young winery for Barolo. I'm the worst of the second generation. That is the news, Mark, and you didn't know or they would have not invited me, uh, but <laughs> I really have two fantastic siblings. And we are sort of, you know, a young, a young winery. So, so the, the salary of the facility is very simple. It's very straightforward, but it's enriched by these beautiful stained glass windows. And we wanted the label to be colorful, to tell people, listen, traditional Barolo is not about being boring or, you know, it's not about your birthday wine only, but can be, can be a pleasure to share with, with family and friends and can be a pleasure for, for every week. Hmm. And so this is the dream of Albe. Talking of um, sharing with family and friends, obviously, I don't know if you're looking at uh, gallery view at the moment, Giuseppe, but we've got a lot of uh, groups tasting tonight. I'm really keen to get people involved. Is, does anyone feel like jumping in and, and making a comment about the wine? Has there been any, um, you know, any thoughts on how the Alba, for example, compares to the Barbera or um, any questions that you'd like to ask to the team? Just feel free to either comment or, or jump in and, and unmute. Um, Ali, just uh, whilst uh, people are getting their thoughts together, did you have any ideas and, and thoughts on the, the Alba yourself? Do you know, frustratingly for me, I couldn't get hold of the Alba in the UK. I couldn't get this vintage. <laughs> um, so I, I, I've got, I had the first one and I've got the, I'll have the Costa di Rosse to try the next one. But so unfortunately I, I can't comment on this and I, I have tasted it before, but I'd have to look at my notes to remind myself to, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, so now, unfortunately, I, I can't comment on this, but all I can say is that, you know, a, a broad a view on Nebbiolo versus Barbera, we come from Barbera, and then, you know, obviously Nebbiolo is the noble grape, it's the king of, of, um, of Piemonte. And, and for me, it's, you know, without talking about this particular wine, it's how everything comes together effortlessly. You know, if you look at it on paper, a, a, a grape that is light in colour, high in acidity, high in tannin, high in alcohol, kind of thinking, oh, how's this going to work? But it, 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 it comes together to produce possibly the most haunting ethereal grape variety when it's done well mm. in the world. But within that, there are so many variations, as Giuseppe's been talking about, different vineyard plots. And, and what I love is this, this, this debate, this discussion as to whether it should be the sum of all its parts, so whether the vineyard should be blended together or the single um, plots. You know, I, I love that, which you don't get so much in Burgundy. It's very much, apart from when you're looking at generic Bourgogne, it's very much about the specific plots. And I love that diversity within Piemonte that you have these single vineyard bottlings and the polemic element of what should be done, the traditional versus the modernist. Um, it's very Italian um, and, and for that reason it's wonderful. But Nebbiolo is just, a, is just a hauntingly beautiful grape and I can't wait to get stuck into the Rosso and make a comment on that particular wine. Yeah, we've had actually interestingly some, some comments and um, a few people referred to it uh, from the email and, and Giuseppe mentioned that um, the difference between taking a sip of this wine, and I'm sure the, the next one, um, fresh from opening the cork and decanting, or just giving it some air for a couple of hours is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, I think Jane and Danny have both picked up on that, and I'm, I'm sure others are as well. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I... I'm very, very glad that we, um, we popped the corks on this many, many, many hours ago. That's, that's all I can say, definitely. I love that. And thank you so much. I, I loved reading these comments. Uh, this is really Barolo. And um, how fantastic that um, you, you, you have people like uh, Mark, Luke, Ali and, and their team that can uh, have such a spot on uh, recommendation. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Absolutely. Uh, I think for me, for me, it was, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up right there at the estate. Um, as I mentioned, we were, we were let free to choose our destiny. I actually, up until the day before I signed in while making college, I was thinking to become a heart surgeon. Uh, so our parents, who were quite rebellious in their own days, really let us free, which is not always the case when you come from you know, families that trade land from a generation to the next. And, uh, um, but there was, there was a moment of epiphany for Barolo for me. So it's not enough that you grow up, that you're born in the region to, to really get Barolo. I mean, sure, you grew up hearing people sing, you know, singing the praises of the grape and of the wine. 
but uh, I feel there must be a moment when, when this becomes personal. And I remember for me, it was the night I was 15 years old, 16 years old. My dad invited me to go out with him and uh, an, another uh, producer of the region, his name is Alberto Conterno, and two uh, Somia from, from abroad. And, you know, the four adults were talking. I just went for the food because I knew it was one of the top restaurants of the region. Uh, and, the, and the adults were talking wine. And I was sort of listening and starting to get interested about it. But of course, uh, you know, in my teenage soccer and, and everything else, we ended up the night with at least 12, 13 glasses uh, in front of us. And what, what, remind, what rem, um, remained in me of that night is how the two Barberas we started the night with were fantastic. The sort of, uh, their evolution was limited. They evolved through the night, but you sort of could guess what you were about to smell ahead of, you know, putting the glass under your nose. Uh, the few Sangioveses we ended, sorry, I haven't mentioned this grape. If we can cancel that from the recording, were fantastic, were phenomenal. <laughs> mellows. But perhaps it was very late in the night, but they seemed to be sort of staying monolithic. And then these Barolos we had in between, those were the wines that I would lift a glass. I was not really drinking, I was just tasting and, you know, being not really under strict surveillance, I was <laughs> tasting a lot. But I remember uh, going back to each of these wines and they were always mesmerizing because they were changing. They were evolving so much over the night, over the, or, over the hours of the di uh, dinner. So I love that you had the same impression by popping the corks earlier on and seeing the evolution. I think this is really, to me, one of the things that makes uh, Nebbiolo so fantastic. Just like Ali was saying that... Uh, that haunting element and that uh, element of, uh, in Italian we say cangente, like colors that change their reflection according to the light. Fantastic, what a great insight. And if I could just put a little, a little uh, full stop at the end of that, the, the one thing that I, I really, that interests me so, so much about what you were saying, um, and it, you, you, you've got a great way of, of kind of adding a romantic edge to what, um, to what you're saying here, mate, but that's incredible what you're saying about in the three vineyards, you get to watch the sunrise three times, which of course sounds like such a romantic thing. But what I get out of that is that you've got three very, very different amounts of light that the vines in those vineyards are getting. So that's an over an entire season of, of growing. That's going to be a serious, serious difference in terms of how ripe each one of those is. One of them gets the first light of day and then, and the third one gets maybe, you know, it's only half an hour or 45 minutes. It doesn't sound like, like much, but over an entire season, every single day, that's going to have a real difference. So I can imagine having, taking the strengths and weaknesses of both and kind of, and, and building something that's better than the sum of its parts, as Ali said, um, that'd be such an, such an interesting way of making these wines. And it's, and it's, yeah, it's, it's just a, just really mind blowing. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, no, it's it's fantastic. We, in fact, this is one of the wines where we have the most fun, as well as the hardest time when we work on the blend, because the blocks are so distinctive, and uh, and then you're working to find sort of, I mean, we we don't like the word perfect, but the best blend you you can achieve for the year. And is uh, it is really fun. It's it's one of the things I love the most about our work is when we sit down in the tasting room with all the barrel samples and we start discussing and, and working and it's a bit of philosophy and then you try to do the blend in small scale and then all of your philosophy is not worth much and you have to restart from scratches because what you thought was, uh, that's that's one thing about wine is that it's the opposite of um, of mathematics where one plus one always makes two and one plus two always makes three in wine, it's, it's completely different. The way that um, the personality of each juice sort of in, interconnects with the others, there's always a, an element of, let me call it a mystery or, or something you can only discover once you start working on it. You can't just make a theory out of it. And, and on the aspect of um, exposures, I think it's a very acute um, point you're, you're, you're making, Mark. We did a research with the University of Torino 10 years ago. It was a small sort of self-financed research, but um, I think it was a bit ahead of the curve of what's been going on these days. Historically, in Barolo, the, the, the best blocks used to be considered southwest or uh, facing vineyards. 
And the, the, the main reason for that is that you would get the, the peak of temperature, which in the 60s, 70s, 80s was extremely important. What we noticed today is that uh, the southeast orientation tend to receive that more light, but in terms of temperature, they never go as high as the west locks. So you, you end up having a vine that has received more light, which means more aromatics, uh, more phenolic ripening, which translates into aromatics and uh, more polished tannins, but without the, the, the heat peak that you get on the west. And I think this is really interesting going forward in terms of how we look at vineyards and you know, how each, each crew behaves according to the vintage. <laughs> Fantastic. I think that's a, a brilliant way to uh, move on to the third wine. Absolutely, um, yeah. So I'm just going to change this screen here um, to get us onto, onto this wine. But in all honesty, I, I think we're going to spend the majority of time in the, the Google map here because this is where we really get to see the... Abs, the I mean, it is a beautiful image nonetheless, of, of course, but also get to see the specifics of, of the aspect and, and where it's facing. So... Luke, I'm going to throw over to you, and we're going to we're going to go into uh, going to find the, the Costa de Rosa single vineyard, the the crew. Fantastic. So we'll just move over to uh, the east and focus on Costa de Rosa. Yeah. So it's just to the to the east on the eastern side of of the the town of Barolo we're talking about now. And as we go in here, you'll see on the, the you can you get a hint of the topography here, and and you're, you're kind of going to the top of the hill. So. Giuseppe, I'll, I'll hand back to you, of course, mate. And and you want to give us a bit of an insight as to what makes this this crew special for you? Yes, it's a, to start. I'm very excited. We we get to present Costa di Rosa because this is sort of the baby, the the newest crew we've been releasing. 2015 being the first vintage. Uh, the first thing to to be pointed out is that this is a crew located right in between two of the most uh, famed vineyards of the region. To, to your north, as we look, just tied to the village of Barolo is the crew of Canubi, whereas just to the south of Costa di Rosa, you got Busia, which is the vineyard you see right in the forefront of the, of the picture. Uh, but Costa di Rosa is such a smaller crew, it's pretty much just that triangle slope that you see where the bottle is located from there down to the bottom of the hill. What we farm is the, is the two parcels up to the to the top of the of the hill of the MGA. It's so small. There is no paved road. You only access the vineyard by going a, a very bumpy and uh, and challenging off off road. And these uh, situations, so the lack of a uh, scale of production and the lack of easy access, has always retained Costa di Rosa as a sort of a local secret that uh, never achieved sort of the the, the big stage and in international. Uh, on international markets. Uh, the, fun, the funny story behind us farming this vineyard is that we were approached by the owner of this block because he knew we had a, a love for Dolcetto as well, which is the third uh, important red grape of the region, sort of the more uh, simple and easy going. And he offered us the most awkward deal, which, which was that he wanted us to buy his Dolcetto vineyard and rent his Costa di Rosa block. Now, I can tell you right away, 99% of our colleagues would have refused that deal. You know, they could have maybe rented the Dolcetto Vineyard in return for buying the Nebbiolo block, the Barolo block. But that's exactly why it came to us. But we, with a bit of a leap of faith, we decided to, to say yes. And then two years later, in 2017, we finally actually had a chance to, to purchase the block, which is, uh, which is extremely important. All of our vineyards are state farmed, sorry, are, are, are organically farmed which meant we had already gone for a long-term agreement, but then to eventually own it and be able to, to really uh, think every day of work we spend in the vineyard is for the long run, it's, it's fantastic. Now, besides the location, what I really love, Mark, about Costa di Rosa, what I think makes this vineyard uh, special and stand out in the context of the whole region of Barolo is the amount of sand. It's slightly to the east of the of the. Google Earth picture that we're watching, you see there's a sort of a, an even field on a, on, a, on a slide, on a slope. Uh, perfect, just, just say there. So literally, uh, it looks like a dune and is just 
just bordering, perfect, right where the mouse, the mouse is. That is a dune of pretty pure sandstone, which we call Arenaria di Diano. Of course, some grass has grown on it, but when you walk side to it, you can realize this is uh, at, at least three meters tall and grows up to be about 15 meters tall above the vineyard. It's compacted the uh, sands. Uh, they were sort of, they emerged from, from the sea that used to cover Piemonte around eight to 10 million years ago. And Arenari di Diano is the most rare of the three soil types that, uh, con that underlie Barolo as a whole. And it's really the predominant soil in Costa di Rose. Now, what is the aspect, what is the uh, feature of sandstones of Arenaria in Nebbiolo? Uh, they produce more lifted and sort of open need aromatics. So an element that is really signature of Costa di Rose is a mix of cherry and cherry stone combined with some rose petals on the nose that is really uh, consistent vintage after vintage. And then in terms of the palate, having a high content of scent means that the tannins are not as tight or, or, or powerful as you would get from clays. They tend to be fairly aerial. The wine tend to be very lifted and aerial. And so the, the feature of Costa di Rosa is to sort of bring you into a single vineyard, but a single vineyard that has sort of textbook aromatics on the nose and then it is a bit more open meat on the palate and really offers um, a lot of fun uh, and classic pleasure of drinking Barolo. Fantastic. And Sorry I, guys, I, I, spoke, I spoke too much. No, 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 not at all, mate. I'm absolutely loving it. But I, I love your, your analogy of, of this being a, a bit of a secret wine. And you, you do, I, I definitely, definitely agree with you. And I, I see this a lot in, in the wine world where you've got the the larger kind of grand cru so to speak the larger vineyards are the ones that more people are making wines with and there are more bottles that come off these bigger vineyards which means that they go to more markets and they're more available and then those wines get scored higher and they and more people try them so there's more word there's more talk about them so they become the really famous ones but the ones that are next door that are too small to, to kind of even leave the region, really. They're the ones that kind of get forgotten about, but they're, they're just as good, if not better, than these, these bigger vineyards. So it's so fantastic to share that, that, that we get to try this little secret wine. Because honestly, when, when I was going through the map of, of Barolo, I was looking, I knew where it was. I was like, it's, it should be in this area just outside of the town of Barolo. And it took me so long to find the little pin that was Costa de Rosa because it's so tiny, this little vineyard. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's, it's great. It's really, really great to get your insight on that, mate. It's fantastic. So we'd love to hear some feedback from, uh, from, our, from our customers here as well, because I think that's looking pretty damn special right now. Um, and I'm just going to take the screen back off you if that's all right, Luke. And we'll yeah, gonna... just um, to jump in there, Mark, obviously, um, quite a, uh, a nice segue. We've got about five minutes left. So now that we've tried the three wines, uh, would love to see people's favorites. Uh, we've got a few texts in so far, but obviously if you text in, you've got a chance to win uh, $50 credit. So it's uh, a good opportunity. I'm just going to take it to this page here because we just want to remind everyone uh, what, the, what the words are that we want you to use if you, if you aren't interested. So sorry, Ali, over to you, mate. Just want to ask Giuseppe a, a, a question. I am um, I, two questions really that kind of go into one. Firstly, on this wine, I saw in your tasting note that you, that you mentioned mint, and for me, there's a really distinct, fresh mint character in this that's just at the end, which I haven't really found that much before in many other Barolas, but really find here. Um, is that specifically from? This vineyard, is it a sign of the, the vintage? Because I know 15 was a fairly, a fairly warm vintage, wasn't it? I think it was quite an early harvest, maybe than, than a couple of others. So is that a, a signature of, the, of vintage or is it a signature of the, of, of the vineyard? Well, thank you so much, so very much for this question. Apologies, I had to, to shift uh, camera, but my laptop was, was running out of juice. <laughs> I, I'd say mint is... is um, Mint is an element that you can find fairly frequently into, into Barolo wines. Okay. 
I usually associate it to um, deeper soils. So where the bedrock is sort of deeper, that is where I would find a, a bit more a bit more of mint rather than sort of shallow soils. I do think that the weather doesn't have that much of an influence on the uh, on the mint character. I actually do associate uh, mintness to sort of again deep soil meaning a bit more water retention. But that's that's been a big surprise for us. Now, just just to put things in perspective, 2015 was a warmer vintage. And this is a sandy soil, so you would imagine there is a lot of drainage and there is a lot of suffering. I was actually, um, I was actually uh, very surprised to see how resilient the vines have been. Um, and I associate that to sort of the older soils of the region. So when you're in that range of eight to thirteen million years old soils, is where you, I find more of the mintiness. Uh, so that would be the central area of Barolo, going to the south and going to the east. So apologies that I don't have a sort of more focused definition, but you would find mintiness in Costa de Rosa sometimes, you'll find it sometimes in Tortonian soils, but you definitely find it from sort of that Barolo Castiglione uh, boundary to the south, which is sort of the older soils, whereas it's not as evident perhaps as you go north and west to find it. Okay, great. I hope Perfect. these can okay. answer. Yeah, brilliant. Perfect. Okay, so... Uh, if everyone's got their uh, got the picks in, we might hand over to Luke, who will. <laughs> Mark, you're gonna you're gonna have to tread water for a second here. I'm I'm still I'm getting to, a lot of text. Got to do some fill. <laughs> got to do some fill. Um, before before we do wrap up, because we are we are definitely getting towards the end of the hour here. I just wanted to say thank you to Giuseppe for for his time today. Um, I, I mentioned it at the start, but I, I have to say it again. Uh, Giuseppe's actually calling in on his holiday. And um, and I and I know that I mean this I, I know you you wouldn't get too much of a holiday in the job that you're in uh, and and when we we did a little uh, dry run a couple of days ago and you were there with your son and, and I feel kind of I feel guilty for taking you away from from your your lovely holiday because the weather does look absolutely fantastic where you are right now but um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time tonight. And um, I said it before, and I'll, I'll say it again. You have a fantastic way of of adding these kind of romantic twists to to what to what is really really important information. And I I only tend to get kind of the geeky things out of it, but you have a, a great way of adding a romantic way of uh, of saying it. So thank you, mate. Um, no, th thank you guys for for having us. It's um, it's very simple. We 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 choose this word. Because um, oh, Mark, sorry, I gotta steal you one moment, but I see you. You still working, so maybe it's okay. I I, meant, <laughs> I was mentioning about uh, you know not being sure whether I wanted to be a heart surgeon or a winemaker, and then what changed the game was that on the very last, I had passed the exam to go to medical school, so both both ways were open for me. Um, and uh, and the last night I was really in troubles because I couldn't make up my mind. I loved wine by then; I was eighteen. Uh, but also thought I wanted to do something good in my life. <laughs> and, uh, and I asked my dad, Papa, what is the social purpose of our job? And there was a very long moment of silence where it seemed it lasted for a long time. Many, many years later, my dad uh, admitted he didn't have an answer ready. And eventually he, got in, he, he chose it as a 15-year-old. He was this naughty kid from the city who was caught in protests back in 1968 and sent back to the family farm. So he would stay out of troubles. And that's how he felt in love to farming and he loved the freedom of nature and he loved tractors. And that's how he started very simply. But that night he, he got inspired by painting our family still on, on, on family, family house and, uh, and pointed out to that and said, look at, look at that painting. We don't need it to live, but how would be life without a paint, paint tree or, or poetry? Um, what would be the difference between human life and animal life? And this is, so we don't save lives, but the social purpose of wine is to bring a bit of beauty. And this is what makes it uh, fun, easy, and, and, and also makes me grateful for this chance today because um, this is what we do is, um, and so there's no, there's no disconnect between working and holiday in the sense that um, it's, about, it's about sharing, sharing a, uh, all the efforts, but also all the beauty we, we, we try to live every day. And, um, 
and we feel the world needs these more than ever. And, and so thank you so much. It's, it's been a, a true pleasure. Your, your liquid poetry is much, wow. uh, much appreciated. That, that was incredible. <laughs> and also they say a glass of red wine every night is good for the heart. So, I mean, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. <laughs> and I definitely find myself being better with that juice than the other. So it's, it, all, it all turned out great. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. So, Luke, we ready to go now, mate? Yep. Uh, we are all good to go. Let me just uh, pull the screen up. All yours. Okay, so thanks everybody to, uh, who texted in. Um, I'm going to give it a spin and, and good luck. Need some dramatic music. <laughs> we do need some dramatic <laughs> music, don't we? Well done, John. <laughs> Congratulations, John. Alison, I'm sorry you were so close. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's, um, that wraps us up, ladies and gents. Thank you so much again for coming this evening. We hope you enjoyed. Those were some seriously, seriously impressive wines. Um, and, and I hope you enjoyed them. I'm sure you did because they were great. And uh, thank you, Giuseppe. Thank you to my team who are fantastic as ever. Thank you, Ali from London for calling in this morning. I hope you had enjoyed your Nebbiolo with your coffee this morning. I said, and, yeah, I did. I did. I did. I got in. I got in trouble a little bit on the chat because I think Danny asked me what I was having. I said a morning croissant, and then he said that you couldn't, you can't mix French with Italian. But I did save it by the fact I'm having Nutella from Piemonte with my croissant. So uh, that's my. That was my Italian save. <laughs> but good. thanks to Steffi for joining us, mate. That was really fantastic, and thank you to all the team over there. Um, it is a brilliant, brilliant start to my day. I've got a big smile on my face and the sun shining so thank you very much indeed <laughs> fantastic and <laughs> um, tutti. yeah Grazie. thank you so much giuseppe and uh any anyone interested so we, we're have, doing something different next week we're actually going to be doing a whiskey tutorial so if anyone's interested there are still a couple of seats left at that so uh thank you so much everyone for coming and uh, we appreciate it sorry and, mark just to yeah, just to jump in there um a few, a few people have asked after every tasting if we have availability of the wines that we've tasted. Um, and I'm pretty sure, you, obviously, you know, just as well as I do, all of the, uh, the Vajra wines are pretty good at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's a great opportunity to try some uh, amazing Nebbiolo. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Uh, Giuseppe, grazie, grazie mille, mi signore. Grazie mille. A tutti. Grazie, Mark, Luke, Jane, Ali. Take care, everyone. And uh, we'll soon hopefully see you here in Italy or, or, uh, or we're, we're all praying. We're, pra we're praying. We're praying very hard. <laughs> Un abbraccio. Wow. Grazie. Ciao, ciao. ciao. Grazie. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Take care, everyone.